<clears throat> Tommy, are you there? Uh, yeah. Putting my phone on airplane mode. Oh, yeah. Sorry, so we're not providing a physical location. Oh. Yeah, no, it's still under the EP. Still under the EP. We can, whenever. Okay, we're ready to go, Chair. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us. This is the February 4, 2022 meeting of the Board and Land and Natural Resources. It's 9.02 a.m. I'm Suzanne Case, the chair. This meeting is being held uh, online via uh, Zoom and because of the ongoing COVID pandemic. And um, so people uh, who have signed up in advance to testify are in the waiting room and you'll be let in to the main room when your agenda item is up. And please keep your video and audio off until it's your turn to speak. And please also, when you come into the meeting, turn off your YouTube or else we'll get an echo. The general public is able to testify, I mean, to watch uh, live on YouTube. Also, there is a phone in number um, on the agenda in case you decide during the meeting you want to testify um, live. Uh, we have written testimony that's been submitted and is made available to the board members. Um, and with that, Member Kanto, would you kindly read the standard contested case statement? Sure. In some of the matters before the board, a person may wish to request the contested case hearing. If such a request is made before the board's decision, then the board will consider the request first before considering the merits of the item before it. A person who wants a contested case may also wait until the board decides the issue, then request the contested case after the decision. It is up to you. Any request must be made in writing within 10 days. If no request for contested case is made, the board will make a decision. The, the department will treat the decision as final and proceed accordingly. Thank you. And um, I also wanted to mention this is a special meeting of the land board. Uh, because the regular meeting last week had to be rescheduled uh, to add some things um, in, into the agenda format. Um, we're generally today going to go in order of the agenda. So first, we're going to take the M items, and then we'll generally go in order. So if you'll bear with me, we'll um, uh, get the M item people in here. Sure, I'm sorry. Did we? Did I miss roll call? I'm sorry. Thank you. We did. Um, okay, let's do a roll call. I'm Suzanne Case, the chairperson, and there is no one in the room with me. Okay, Member Canto. My name is Doreen Canto, and uh, member of the board, and there is no one here with me. Member Char. This is Vernon Char. I'm in the room alone. Thank you, Member Oi. Well, Tommy Oi, no one is with me. Thank you, Member Yoon. Ms. Kayevi, board member, just me, myself, and I, no one in the room. Member Yuen. Hello, everyone. I'm Chris Yuen, and my wife will be going in and out of the room. Thank you. And uh, Member Barnes. Hello, I'm Member Barnes. Um, I'm in the room alone currently, but my husband is also working from home, so may be in and out of the room. Thank you. Uh, all right. Um, M items. Ms. LaRue, let's just see here. Um, M one through four. Let me ask if any board members have any questions on M one through M4. There's no public testimony on them. Okay, no questions, they're straightforward. Is there a motion to approve M1 through four as submitted? So moved. Thank you, second. second. 
Thank you. All in favor, say aye. 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 Okay, let, let's do a first first vote um, verbally, and and, and then then uh, if it's unanimous after that, we will. I will just say so. So, uh, case votes aye. Canto. Aye. Char. Aye. Boy. Aye. Yoon. Aye. Yuen. Aye. Barnes. Thank you. Aye. Thank you, Ms. LaRue. Have a great Thank weekend. Thank you. Uh, okay. Uh, M items uh, five and six. Uh, Jennifer Tomita, I think, are you? Uh, Hi. Good morning. Jennifer Tomita, property manager with DOT Harbors, here to answer any questions you may have Thank on you. M5. Okay, board M5. members, do you have any questions on M5 through 6? Five, 5 and 6. Uh, okay, there's no testimony. Um, is there a motion to approve M5 and 6 as submitted? Move to approve. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. All right, all in favor say aye. 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 Thank you, that is a unanimous vote. Okay, M7, uh, we do have to bring some folks in here. Um, let's see, where did you go? Okay, okay. We did have her in the waiting room, but she's not there now. Okay, we'll keep an eye on it. Uh, so M7, um, Mark Patterson, please, please go ahead. Uh, you're on mute, sorry. Good morning. Can you hear me now? Yeah, but you have to turn off your YouTube if it's still on. Okay, we'll keep an eye on it. Uh, so M7, um, Mark Patterson, please, please go ahead. Okay. Am, am I coming in clear now? Sorry. No, you, you, have, you have YouTube on still. Okay, I'm sorry. Let, give, me, give me a second. Yep, take your time. Yeah, but you have to turn off your YouTube if it's still on. Yeah, I think it's off. Yeah, that is the YouTube on delay that you that is playing on your computer. Am I coming in clear now? No, you, you have you have YouTube on still. Okay, I'm sorry. Let me give me a second. Yeah, take your time. <laughs> your YouTube on somewhere in your no I do not I shut it down thank you Mark go to your Google and oh try open it up and see if your YouTube is there I, I can hear the, the the refer but I don't see it on my computer I'm sorry everyone the only thing bad about it is hearing my voice all over again somewhere in your Okay, let me no, just... You might try closing your internet browser altogether because you're on the meeting via Zoom. Google and open it up and see if your YouTube is there. I can hear the the refer, but I don't see it on my computer. I'm sorry, everyone. Uh, 
All right, we'll wait till he logs back in. Arlene, is he doing both M7 and M8? Yes. Okay. Mm. Are there other people here who want to testify on those two? Maybe we can take them and then wait for him uh, to come back on. Um, there, there are. Uh, let's see, Lila King, are you are you presenting this also? I mean, maybe you could just present it. Oh, okay. Um, hi, good morning, chair and members. My name is Lila King. I'm the special assistant to Director Betts, the Director of Human Services. We also have uh, Leanne Gillespie, who is the executive director of the Office of Youth Services, which is an attached agency to the Department of Human Services. And I believe you, you may be familiar with Mark Patterson. He is... Um, he runs the Hawaii Youth Correctional Facility, and um, we respectfully we come for the board today, um, and we do have two specific requests. I believe it is um, agenda item seven and eight. The reason that it is split is because we actually are coming, if you combine both requests, we're asking for permission or approval for direct leases for four nonprofits that have been um, operating on HYCF land with prior permission from the board um, under, um, I believe it was permits that we had come before the board a few years ago. And again, the reason it's split is we are asking for approval of the direct leases, but we split off the uh, Partners um, in Development Foundation because there is an extra ask for that because PIDF is also um, we were collaborating with PIDF because they are operating their um, Kupa Aina farms. And so there is a special request to ask for permission to, um, to actually operate their commercial activities on it. So, um, so I, that is the gist of the two requests. And I'm gonna defer to Mark Patterson and I and and maybe Leanne, I think if she has some specific details of it, but that is the general request chair. Okay, thank you very much. Um, let's see, Mark Patterson, you want to do you want to add anything? We did. Uh, Delilah King just did a presentation on it while you were out. Yeah, and you're on mute still. My apologies for, uh, you know, my job description didn't have technology in it. So uh, other than that, I'm a regular state worker. So thank you for bearing with me. Uh, real quick, I don't, I'm not sure what uh, Lila mentioned, but if I can do a real quick overview, you know, it, it's been about four years since I've last sat in front of the board when we ventured on this journey of creating uh, what we're calling a, a, a healing center, a pool honua here at the Kawailoa Youth and Family Wellness Center, what we, what we formerly uh, referred to as the Hawaii Youth Correctional Facility Campus. Uh, for those of you who may not know, uh, the campus was founded in 1928 under the territorial government as the Kawailoa Training School for Girls. Yeah, it is literally 94 years old. Uh, we have, it was a thousand acre farm and uh, ranch, yeah. The territory also opened a thousand acre uh, training school for boys on the North Shore that was called Bailele, uh, training school for boys. Now, I share this with you. We, we are uh, 94 years later, we are down to 500 acres, uh, multiple structures, and um, we still have the original descendants of the herd of cattle here and we're managing a farm at this time. So we're excited to kind of go back to where we came from 
in terms of uh, not just working with the girls who have always been on property, but expanding our scope. Now, you need to understand that in the past decade, juvenile justice reform led by the judiciary and the Office of Youth Service uh, coming out verbally saying that kids don't belong in prison uh, began diversion alternatives to de de uh, populate our incarcerated uh, juveniles. So in a 10 year period, uh, we have reduced the population <clears throat> by 83%. Yeah, where 10 years ago, we had over 100 kids on campus. We're down to today's count is 17 incarcerated, four girls and 13 boys. What's significant for some of you, and we continue to do this work in, in decreasing the numbers, is half of that number are from the neighbor islands. Yeah. So we're really looking at how do we create more alternative services or diversions from our incarcerated uh, model into more community-based programming for our most vulnerable children. So in four years ago, when we created the Kauai Youth and Family Wellness Center, we looked at how more can we help in prevention and in transition, yeah? Preventing the kids from going into incarceration and, take, and, and giving them programs that make them successful back in the community with their families or on their own. So currently we are serving um, 13 to 24 year olds on campus in residential programs and day programs. Pre-COVID, we were serving up to two to 300 youth a month. Yeah. So real quick, uh, in, in, in besides the incarcerated population, we do have DOE on property with Olomana School. Yeah. We have um, RISE that runs a homeless shelter, our nonprofit uh, partnerships. Halikipa runs an assessment center for victims of sex trafficking, minors. We have a vocational program run by Akina Eha for uh, 13 to 24 year olds. And, and I'm, I'm kind of going off track, but specifically we're here to talk about an M7 is our partnership with Partners in Development. You can see behind me the Kupa Aina Farm. It's five acres that we started uh, <clears throat> four years ago that um, pretty much produces taro. We have avocados, ulu growing, bananas, and we just have, this is a farm that we're calling an educational and treatment platform for the residents on our property, as well as the community partners that come in and work the farm. Yeah, we wanna be able to be, give leases uh, to partners in development to, to continue their farming efforts, as well as to provide them with an opportunity to sell their products on the open market so they can reinvest into the program. And what we feel is most importantly is to provide stipends for the children and the young adults who are working, yeah, and create a, lit a financial literacy program. And in case of my population, provide opportunities for the children to pay their restitution uh, that is placed upon them by family court. We have done programs that uh, have been uh, doing this already as we speak. Uh, we have gotten resources from the fi uh, foundational community that allows us to pay the kids, but we're hoping that the farm can be able to sustain itself. So for in terms of M7, that's what we're asking right now. We can get more individual numbers, but because we could not sell the produce, they have been given through Partners in Development's active role in the community uh, in feeding families during this COVID period. Yeah. Um, Great, and do you wanna summarize M8 while you're at it? M8, M8. So the gist of all of this is the potential of being able to negotiate with, the, with, our, with our nonprofits uh, a lease. Now everybody get, can get intimidated by 25 year lease, but it really gives us a play time in order to assure that they're uh, managing the population in accordance with OIS and DHS uh, rules. Yeah, and, and, and our mission and our mandates to manage uh, these at risk populations. So in, in providing them with uh, longer leases, we are able to, they are able to go out and get their own resources to manage their programs uh, and, and, and show stability for the funders out there. And so basically that's what we we're asking at this particular point in time. The relationship between the state and the nonprofits is the state maintains the, the management of the buildings in terms of its utilities and the upkeep. 
and the programs are free of that operational expense are able to come in and just manage their programs. Yeah, so it's a great partnership at this particular time. Thank you so much. Uh, Ms. Gillespie, do you want to add anything? Um, yes, yeah, so Leanne Gillespie, I'm the um, administrator for the Office of Youth Services. The only thing I'll add is, is to emphasize Mark's um, statement uh, about the sustainability need for these programs. <laughs> Um, allowing for these leases will provide our programs with a sustainable plan moving forward. So they can take that to funders um, and other agencies to, to make sure they have that foundation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, board members, that's all the testimony we have. Do you have any questions? Yeah, I do. Just one. Uh, yeah. Mark. What is the basic demographic breakdown of the, the 13 to 24 year olds as far as race? If you look at the entire population on campus, you probably serve up to 75% Native Hawaiians. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Ms. Canto. So Mark, um, reference to M7, you mentioned that you're not able to sell the product. Is that correct? Yes. So what do you do with the products? Do you... the, I, I, two things I'll share with you at this particular point in time. The products have been given up in, a, in an effort to donate, to give to the youth, uh, communities, to PIDF's um, uh, food program during this COVID period. So it's with other partners, we're giving the food so it can be passed out to the community. Thank two, you. Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Number two is that the Office of Youth Service has been actively engage in the last three sessions of the legislature to allow for uh, proposing a bill that will allow for a revolving fund for the Office of Youth Service to develop commercial enterprises. Yeah, we have not been successful with that bill and it's being heard again this session. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Ms. Barnes. Um, and I just wanted to confirm following up on member Kento's question. So the um, item that we're voting on today would change that, that and allow for the products to be sold. Is that correct? It would be, it would allow, we will be able to engage in a lease that would allow PIDF to sell their produce for the pro, uh, profits to be returned to the program. Got it. Yes. Okay. Um, just to say thank you all for this incredible work. It's um, just really powerful to hear about what you're doing with the community and the success you've achieved, um, you know, on criminal justice reform, obviously a huge issue and not an easy task. So thank you all for the kuleana that you are showing and the work you're doing with our community. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you um, from, from all of us. And I, I, I did wanna, um, uh, emphasize your last point, Mark, which is um, uh, basically the, the 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 commercial sales are related to your mission. Your 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 mission is to basically get these kids engaged in this kind of you know back to the earth work to produce food, and then you produce the food, you sell it, and you put it back into that operation. So um, appreciate that very much. Thank you. Chris Ewan. Yes, uh, yes uh, it sounds like the program is making a good transition and making great services. And I don't really have any issue with the commercial services, but is this uh, particularly for M7 only or is this for M8 as well? Specifically it... for M7 at this point. Okay, uh, you can always request an amendment to a, this kind of negotiated lease sometime in the future too. Uh, so I take it that you've had a chance to look at the standard lease form because part of our uh, submittal says that the, the, the lease would be issued according to the DLNR's most the current standard nonprofit lease form. And I, I just was wanting to make sure that there weren't other issues that would come up that would need perhaps you to come back. Have you had a chance to look at that lease form? No, we have not. Okay. 
it has been a great struggle just to get to this point, which I'm very excited today. And then we knew that the next point was going to be the um, educating ourselves on the leases. Okay. But you knew that there was going to be, you know, some kind of standard provision against commercial. Yes. Okay. So, uh, well, I, I think we don't want to hold up the action today, but uh, do, do be aware, you know, that the department has this standard form and these things can be brought to the board if they don't fit somebody's particular situation. Uh, even after the, the action is issued, we'd rather do it all at one shot naturally, but if it comes up, then, then don't, don't feel inhibited in, in bringing it back. The other question I have is, I, I wanted to be sure that the Office of Youth Services had adequate ability to uh, terminate or switch partners uh, even if these leases are issued, because as as well as these nonprofits may be doing now, and I have no, I don't want to imply that I have any doubts about that. My experience with nonprofits is that very often they're just a handful of people who are really the core and make them work. And sometimes things change. And uh, I just wanted to make uh, uh, get an idea for if you issue a twenty five year lease to uh, one of these nonprofits. Are you? Are they also under some kind of contract that needs to be renewed, uh, uh, so that you don't that, that is tied to this, so that uh, the normal controls that that the uh, government agency would have in dealing with a nonprofit exist? I'm 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 just trying to get some feel for that. I'm going to answer it, and, and Leanne and, and Lila can give you the the, the more accurate verbiage, but I'm going to say it from my perspective, the lease is really to say, here is the structure. Yeah. The memorandum of agreement is really where the accountability is going to be laid into this to say that, you know, this is the population that we expect you to manage. This is the expectations. This is the accountability. Should none of these be met, then the, it voids the lease. I'm thinking that's the, the thought process right now in order to hold, um, the nonprofits uh, accountable for the lease. I don't foresee us giving a 25 year lease in the next year, but working our ways up as, as they improve on their service and our ability to account for what they're doing. Does that make sense for you, Chris? No, that's, that's exactly what I wanted to hear that you have a separate way that you, you know, so basically some kind of contractual agreement that uh, enables you to evaluate the nonprofit's performance. And if it stops being what you expect, that despite having this 25 year lease out there, you would be able to um, uh, move on to a, a different arrangement. Or uh, once you know, you've know you given them a chance to, to cure any difficulties that there might be. So that's, that's the main thing that I, uh, I wanted to be assured of before we went ahead with this. Otherwise, you know, my tendency is, let the people who are, you know, uh, working on these problems have the resources to do them. And we're just like a gatekeeper at the board here. Uh, and we should try to trust the people working on these things as much as we can. All set. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. If not, is there a motion to approve? Uh, M, let's do M7 and 8 together as submitted. Move to approve. Thank you. Is there a second? We want, we want the amendment second. on M7. Instead of the standard lease form, we want to say that they are authorized to uh, have commercial sales. And, and the exact language we can leave up for, for later. I don't, uh, that's, they did request that. Yeah. Uh, and, and so it would be a, uh, commercial sales related to the mission um, of the of the nonprofit, not general commercial, not general commercial, you know, not like a McDonald's or something like that, but a, a sale of products that are mission related. Okay, good. good. Okay, sorry, Kaivi, you take that. Yep. Okay, uh, and is there a second on that? Second from Member Barnes. All in favor? Say aye. 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 All right. Um, sorry, Member Kanto, I, I, I lost you. Hi. 
Okay, thank you. That is unanimous. Uh, again, thank you so much for all of your great thank you, work. everybody. Um, it, it really makes a big difference for a lot of people. So it's 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 good work. All right, thank you. Thank you. Aloha. Aloha. Thank you. All right, we're gonna move on to the D items. Uh, the D item. Okay, um, land division. I think we have everybody. We do, we don't have saying Kim, but um, we have everybody else. So, um, land division. Lost him. Sorry, we don't quite have everybody yet. Bear with me. Okay, Russell Suji, you want to go ahead for land division D1? Yeah, uh, one second. Uh, okay, uh, good morning, board members. Uh, D1 is a right of entry to the Hawaii Marine Mammal Alliance um, that for uh, right of entry into the submerged land area off of Oahu and Molokai. Um, for the purposes of the um, preservation and recovery of the threatened and endangered species. I don't have anything more specific to add. I believe, I think the applicant might be on board or my staff, Barbara Lee, is on hand to uh, answer any questions if you have any. Uh, I guess like, my question is why is this limited to Oahu and Maui and Molokai? Maui County, I think it is. Yeah. That was the request. Uh, is anyone from the uh, applicant here? Yes, I'm here, John Gelman. Mr. Gelman, do you wanna to speak to this? Uh, sure, yeah, our current grants uh, to perform our activity with NOAA uh, only are uh, for Oahu and Molokai. So that's our request. Is there a different organization that works on Kauai on the Big Island and Maui Nui? Uh, Kauai is NOAA themselves, and Big Island and Maui is the Marine Mammal Center. Uh, I see. Okay, thank you. Okay, any other questions? Anything else you wanted to add, Mr. Gilman? Uh, no, I just appreciate your uh, entertaining this and uh, hopefully approving it. All right. Any questions? Any other questions? If not, is there's no other testimony? Is there a motion to approve D1 as submitted? So moved, Chair. Thank you. Is there a second? Second from Member Barnes. Uh, all right. All in favor, say aye. 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 That is unanimous. All right. Thank you. And again, okay. thank you thank for you. Your, your great work on this. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. All right. We will move on to the E items. So let's do a little change out. <clears throat> let's do E1 first and then we'll bring uh, the E2. <laughs> Uh, Kurt Cottrell, E1. 
we just lose them. <laughs> we have disappearing administrators today. Good morning, uh, Chair, members of the board. My name is Kurt Cottrell. I'm the Administrator for Division of State Parks. And we have two uh, agenda items for you today, E1 and E2. E1 is a very uh, straightforward, retroactive uh, consent to a 2016 assignment of general lease uh, number SP0131 up in Koke'e. Um, and uh, it's, it's pretty straightforward. I don't have any other comments to add uh, at this time for E1. All right, questions, board members. Mr. Oy. Uh, sir, how many vacant cabins do you have up there? I don't know. I think uh, maybe six or seven at this point. I'd have to check in with property management and see. They are preparing bid packages, but we're way behind because of a, a lack of staff. Okay, so it's going uh, because uh, a lot of uh, people on Kauai asking me when it's going to come out to bid. I bet. Yeah, no, it's uh, we're just trying to chip away at a lot of dispositions right now, but we'll get to it. All right. Uh, Thank you. Know. Any other questions on E1? No public testimony. All right. Is there a motion to approve E1 is submitted? Move from OI, is there a second? Second. Second from you. And all in favor say aye. 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 All right. That passes unanimously. Thank you. All right. Hang on a second. I got other folks to bring in here. Yeah, there should be a large gallery, I think, for this one. I think there's a medium gallery and a large amount of testimony, which is great. I'm not sure who Don. Oh, it's Don King. Never mind. Yeah, I, I get it. That's a different number. Um, yeah, I think that's what we got for this item. So okay. please go ahead. Thank you. So item E two is a lot more interesting and uh, has a better backstory than E one. So re request two is to amend general lease SP 0042 to Cocoa Kalihi Valley, which is a comprehensive family health service up in uh, Kalihi, which is like right up the street actually from my house. So I go by there all the time. This is an anomaly for us. Um, this, this piece of land, about a hundred acres or so, if you look at the zoning, it's conservation and urban, it's restricted preservation, it's general preservation, and it's a residential. And it, it really doesn't fit as a state park, but years ago, you know, my predecessors agreed that we, we should uh, take on the the management of the of the property and the lease and so we named it a state park reserve and we've pretty much turned our back on it since that point in time um Kokoka Lee valley is a, is an amazing organization what they do for the community uh you know, in general due to you know uh, improving health and kind of similar to um the gentleman and his organization in your mm -hmm. the other uh discussion you had for that board uh item so what we're asking for is to uh, essentially um, extend the lease for an additional 35 years. And, but in doing so, um, we're gonna make some adjustments. Uh, they have, we have some after the fact uh, in compliance that we're gonna, Kokua Kalihi Valley has agreed that they will uh, implement and they're in the process of doing that now. And again, it's just one of the problems you have where you have a lot of dispositions and not enough property managers to do inspections comparable to land division. So, you know, things happen and then we finally find out about it and we have to make corrections. Um, one of the other changes, uh, again, like the other submittal is the ability for commercial activity that is once again, commensurate with the program that they deliver. So they've subsequently, they've set up an apothecary or for La'olapa'au 
for medicinal plants. And I, I believe, you know, I've seen on site where they store them and I, uh, they'd like to sell those. And they're also to charge for some of the programs that they conduct there um, at um, Ho'ula Aina, basically is the, the programming up on the park. And again, it's, it's within the, the character of their use. So we're comfortable with them and are acutely aware of the need to generate income as we do at state parks to manage various programs and activities. So without any much further ado, because uh, I know there's several of them that are very eager to advocate for their program, so at this point, um, Chair Case, I'm, I'm pretty much done with my, uh, my narrative uh, until there's questions. Okay, um, before we get to that, uh, Alan uh, Carpenter or Heather McMillan, did anything you wanted to add to that presentation? Um, <laughs> Alan? Uh, no, I think Kurt covered it pretty well. Okay, oh. thank you. He Heather, anything you wanna um, add? I'll just briefly say that we'll stand on our written testimony. Um, Ho'ulu Aina is a model program and a long-term wonderful partner for Ka'ulunani Urban and Community Forestry as well as Forest Stewardship. They not only lift up that community, they, they have a huge impact. Um, so we're, we're strongly supporting. Thank you. Okay, wonderful. And um, so I will go through the folks that have signed up to testify. Thank you for being here and thank you for all the... Suzanne, Great testimony. Suzanne, yeah. I, have some, I have a question on the staff. Yeah, sure. Um, the, I, I did visit the property this week and um, had a great walk through. Um, there are several structures on the property and uh, are those belonging to the Lessee or the lessor? Does the state own the the houses that are there? Uh, the point I'm I'm coming to is, I'm wondering whether an extension of the lease, amending the commercial aspects, is one alternative. But the other would be to issue a, a brand new lease, since the current lease I think runs off in a couple of years. And my concern is, um, so that there's no misunderstanding, who owns the residence? and houses that are there and, um, you know, who's, who's responsible for maintenance and then the surrender value and so forth. Um, if I may, Kurt. Go for it. So there, at the time the lease was um, originally encumbered, there was um, a, a historic residence already on the property. And that was um, rehabilitated uh, with funds by the lessee. Uh, and I think a caretaker lives in that house today. That That is a state-owned improvement. I believe the conditions of the lease um, indicate that uh, new improvements are owned by the lessee, right? But frequently at the end of a term, if they then become the property of the state, we, they either can remove them or um, we can maintain ownership. But uh, anything that was there before, especially the, the I think there were uh, historic house, and a building, uh, those are state-owned improvements, but the, the lease calls for the tenant to maintain them. Okay. Does that answer your question? Uh, so the structures that are there that were not already on the property were put out by the lessee? Correct. Right, yeah. And uh, board member Char, good, great questions, uh, especially in regards to new lease versus old. Um, part of the compliance that we're ca having to catch up on is after the fact permits for the buildings. In regards to a new lease, um, I think uh, it's an interesting idea, but we decided, you know, in talking with the AG that it was okay just to go ahead and, and tag on another 35 years and make these adjustments rather than, you know, craft an entire, you know, new document. Okay. And I think part of that reasoning they need the extension is to amortize costs for, they have a very large new community facility proposed, right? Yeah. Which is going to be built. They're doing a, a supplemental EA for it. There's going to be a process. We'll be coming back to you guys to approve that a little bit later on, but um, well, they're, the they're all, current, they're all kind of yeah. interrelated. Under the, current right? lease, under the current lease as extended, uh, any additional improvements on the, that comply with the city ordinances? Uh, would have to come back to the board. Correct. Okay. Thank you. 
Thank you. Any other questions of staff at this time? Chris Ewan? Is there a maximum term? And there must be, but I don't know what it is. Is there a maximum term of a nonprofit lease? Under uh, 65, yeah. 65, sounds right. Okay, so this is under, this would be 60 total with the extension. And part of the reason we're coming a little early um, on, because they still have some hair left on their term, is I'm an, I understand there's a large federal grant that they've applied for, and they need to, you know, show commitment to the property over an extended period to ensure that they can uh, get the grant and build their new holiday. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, let's see. Let's go with public testimony. David Deroof. Chair Case, uh, if you don't mind, I'd um, defer to some of uh, my community colleagues that, um, to go first and I can close if that's all right. You bet. Uh, Kanoa O'Connor. Aloha, good morning, board. Um, my name is Kanoa O'Connor. I uh, was a longtime community member. I grew up here in Kalihi Valley and I now have the privilege of working at KKV. And um, I just want to testify in full support of everything that you guys have been able to read uh, about the about the program. And I, I actually want to also let our, our community speak. But thank you so much for having us and and uh, supporting us through this process. Thank you, um, Joseph Miller. Are you you want to take your get off mute? There you go. You hear me now? Yep. Thank you so much. I'm I'm uh, here to support uh, the extension of Hulu Ina's lease. I'm a I live half a mile, three quarters of a mile down the road, and I'm just so glad they're are in our neighborhood. I've been here 41 years, raised my kids, three kids here in Kalihi Valley, and uh, I you know used to go hiking up there, and I remember finding like a Jurassic Park picture with uh, you know equipment, heavy equipment in the forest, an abandoned house, I believe, a bunkhouse, some homeless living there. That was like 25, 30 years ago. And uh, since they've come, it's just like a transformation, the, the landscape, the feeling of welcome. I'm just happy to see families come up. I've been up there on work days with 100 people, you know, people from around the world, uh, university nurses to, you know, people from the valley. I like the idea of the Hawaiian culture values being implemented there and hosting, meeting Micronesians, people from all over the Pacific, there on the land. So they're building a, a really rebuilding, I think, a relationship to the land. That's really, really important to me, given the state of the world. Second piece is I think they, uh, they really teach a lot. And I think people come there, like you come to, a, the bees come to a flower, you know, you think you're getting something by being there and then you leave with this feeling like the pollen on your legs and you start spreading it. I know my son, Joey, started as a, to fulfill his Kamehameha scholarship up there, and he's now there. So they're really terrific for the Valley. They're terrific for me as a neighbor. Um, I love seeing the kids. I participate in a couple of the programs and seeing kids not behind their cell phones and no cell phones and wrapped in nature, uh, you know, looking at banana, banana plants, looking at the, at the birds and being held, you know, it's just wonderful to see that. And then I think too, the third thing is that Bringing back the arts is so critical, you know, um, helping kids use their hands. I was up there on Saturday. There were some kids were carving, some kids were block printing. I was working with storytelling with some of the kids and uh, intergenerational con commitments to seeing families there really, uh, yeah, gladdens me. So I wish they can continue because they're great stewards and uh, they're part of, the, I think, the the future that we're all headed for, where we have to become indigenous again, right? Not in the way that maybe we were, but in a new way, we all got to be connected up. So thank you so much. Thank you very much. Uh, Anuhia Diamond. Aloha Nui Kako, Chair Case and members of the board. Um, I'm Anuhia Diamond and I'm speaking on behalf of myself and my keiki. And we've been an active ohana in a number of programs provided by Ho'uluaina. So also we're in full support of this agenda item, requesting the amendments and lease extension for Kokua Kalihi Valley. Um, for over six years and with all four of my keiki, we've had the privilege to make connections and build relationships in programs, events, visits, and other settings provided through Ehuola Junior Chef Competitions, Kalihi Valley Instructional Bike Exchange, Ho'ola Mokawea, 
Mauliola Beach, Roots Cafe, Kokua Kali Valley Health Center, UH, um, Jabsum Youth Research Projects, Mayuka Kuuba'a, and countless numbers of practices and traditions and life skills upheld and perpetuated at KKV's Vahipana Ho'ulu Aina. Um, what this Aina and its Limahana provide to the families and community is a prime example of optimum healthcare rooted in Kuana Ike Hawaii, Native Hawaiian perspective and knowledge. We're more than happy to be ohana to the stewards and kua aina of Kukua Kali Valley, its comprehensive health services, and mm -hmm. um, we join them in their continued mission in recognition and prioritization of cultural education and its role in community transformation. What happens at Ho'ul Aina is life. It's active, it's changing, flowing, evolving, growing, and it's very much alive, and our families and communities need this work to continue so that we can all thrive. Um, I also have with me one of my keiki who wanted to share some mana'o as well. Thank you. All right. Uh, anything else, Ms. Diamond? Yep. Ho'olu Aina carries um, what we as Ohana learn to be what true comprehensive health should look like. And we hope that our Hoa and our Kua Aina can continue to do this much needed work for our communities and for the Pai Aina. Mahalo. Mahalo. Joanne Sark. Aloha, everybody. Good morning. Um, I'm gonna apologize if it sounds like I'm reading some of it, but I have such mad respect for these folks that I wanna be respectful of your time. Um, my name is Joanne Sark and I'm, I am one of the public beneficiaries of the stewards of this program and land. And uh, as a former research director at Papa Ololokahi for 18 years, and now I'm at the John A. Burns School of Medicine, I can really confidently say that they too have benefited by their association with Ho'ulu Aina's cultural education, mm -hmm. agricultural and recreational programs. Um, as an educator myself, um, Ho'ulu Aina continues to be a learning site for interns at the university, public health, nursing, social work. You know, they provide students the hands-on culture and practice. They don't talk about Malama Aina, they actually practice it and they create opportunities for engagement. You know, finding placements for students is difficult, but to find a placement like this is, is a gem. And when our students put their hands in the earth and they clean pili grass, which my daughter did for a few months, they learn history, they learn significance of place. And I think more important, they work together with the community members and staff. This is learning that doesn't come in a book. It's not in the Western curriculum. You know, one of my responsibilities now at the School of Medicine is I, my job is to nurture trust-based relationships with community groups because they have been left out of the research enterprise. And Ho'olu Aina is one of the programs I strongly depend on because I know that people doing research in the communities, they're gonna be held accountable. Ho'olu Aina, you know, conducts research that's respectable and they get a lived experience. Uh, I read a lot of abstracts and I'll tell you, they have no clue about the people they think they're helping. So when I can see them interact and be in a place that is respectful of research and has a bar for a researcher conduct and more importantly, looks at the tangible benefits for the community, that's priceless. They're also been, they've also been an ideal conduit for me in particular as a research director in disseminating research findings. You know, some of us participate, but they're in journals we don't read and uh, maybe they don't come to fruition for 20 years, but they are so helpful about taking findings beyond the academic campus and back into the communities. You know, I recently had uh, worked with them to do a webinar on research in the community. And, and, I was shocked, but over 400 people tuned into that webinar. And, you know, we all got PowerPoint poisoning at this point and Zoom fatigue, but to see 400 people and 
three were from other countries. It was really refreshing to see that. Uh, I was happy somebody asked about how long leases can be. I was hoping we could, or I could advocate for the lease to be extended in perpetuity. You know, you could not have found better stewards for this, Aina. The program leaders I have learned and have come to know, the future focused, the conservationists, the educators, the cultural practitioners, and their action demonstrates great love for this space. Um, you know, how many of us go to places and know the place names and know the history and the kuleana of that aina that we're working on? They read purpose invasive plants. They implement organic soil science. Uh, they've been restoring and reclaiming spaces for native plants and food crops to feed their community. Watching COVID from the start, they were first out the door in distributing food to the neighborhood, in Kalihi in particular, to our Micronesian and Hawaiian families and Filipino families. And, you know, the food bank recently reminded us that one in four children in Hawaii are at risk for food insecurity. We're the second in the nation, second highest for child food insecurity. How is that even acceptable? You know, Ho'ulu Aina shows me that they are one solution to their community. But more important, it's not just feeding the community, they build skills, they increase capacity, and they model the self-sufficiency that we all say we do, but we rarely achieve. So when I, pre-COVID, of course, if I'm involved in a monthly volunteer Saturday, every third Thursday of the month, I'm one of 100 to 200 volunteers. Who has that kind of attendance? People flock to this place and they're there to pull weeds and clean grass and wash olema or whatever it is that we're tasked, but everybody has kuleana. And um, for kupuna to keiki and, and you know, we always take home something when we leave, always taking home some olena or some lettuce or something. So, you know, in closing, I really have another opportunity to thank KKV and Ho'ulu Aina for the exceptional vision to care for this Aina that continues to feed, inspire, teach, and heal. And I mm -hmm. ask for your support for the extended lease in perpetuity, if that's even, if that's even possible. Um, but thank you for letting me uh, testify today. Thank you very much. Uh, um, Puni Jackson. Um, aloha. I, you know, there's not much that I can say that wasn't said already. And uh, I, I, I just wanted to say thank you for the board and thank you for the staff for supporting us through the process. And I, I, um, I'm appreciating the opportunity for our community members to share with you uh, their love for this up Aina. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, David the Roof. Aloha, good morning. Um... Chair Case, members of the board, David Neroff, I'm the CEO um, and a family doctor at Kokua Kali Valley. I just wanna say on behalf of the 260 staff and our board, um, express my sincere thanks to this board and to the staff of the Department of Land and Natural Resources for this fantastic partnership. Um, when we set out on this relationship 16 years ago, we couldn't have imagined the profound impact it would have on us and our community. We're now celebrating our 50th year of service to the Kalihi community. And I can honestly say, after being there 32 years myself, that the work of Ho'oluaina on this land is, is, is as important as any work that we have engaged in in our 50 years. Um, you've heard from a small cohort of our community about some of that work. And I don't need to elaborate further on their clear observations of the transformative work that <clears throat> has been enabled by this lease. Um, we envision um, much more uh, profound transformative work uh, to take place over the ensuing uh, 35 years should you uh, agree to extend our lease. We extend our sincere thanks to you for this work, for this opportunity. Um, Kokua Kalihi Valley stands ready to make this lease relationship one that you will all be tremendously proud of. And thank you for the chance to testify today. And I'm here to take any questions. Thank you very much. And uh, I thank you all for your work on it. I, I've, I've mm -hmm. had the opportunity to engage with some of you directly on this um, submittal. And, this process. So I've appreciated um, uh, all of your commitment to, to moving this forward. Um, board members, questions? 
Ms. Canto. Sure, I have a question for um, Mr. Cottrell for Kurt, is that possible? Yep. Okay, so Kurt, I'm looking at the recommendation, um, item number four, you know, knowing the permitting process and how long it takes to get permitted, I don't believe that one year, within one year is sufficient time to come into compliance. I, that's a thought I have, so I just needed a comment. But that's a, a good observation, um, and I can uh, defer to Alan or David, but they've already started the process, as I understand it now. They have a consultant. Um, Alan, that's correct. Yeah, they've already started the initiating the bring the, the property into compliance with permits. That is correct. And in fact, um, perhaps someone from uh, Ho'olulu uh, Ho can um, answer that, but they, they know the timeline, and they, they agreed with the year thinking that they could easily comply with it but we could let them speak if if need be well if they've got a jump start on it then you know i'm i'm okay with it and within one year it should should work then yeah yep thank but we you appreciate care. you thinking of that yeah because it does take time yeah. thank you aloha board member Kanto. i can just say um that i've been uh, the one kanoa here uh working directly on that and we we do have the application in already and um our our uh consultant has has told us that the anticipated date is eight months uh, from when we got the application in which was in November so we we if, if it's on time then then we'll, we should be good and if we still would have about five months if if uh, it takes a little bit longer than that so um, in addition to that uh, chair I'm sorry so let's say it bottlenecks in a certain department do they do you come back to the you know this board for an extended so the the way it, the way it's worded is is if they don't do, get it finished within a year then they have to just not use the building um until until it's in compliance okay okay thank you so it's pretty open ended in that sense okay good thank you okay other questions had a question, but more so a comment, Chair. Uh, hey, how's it, Puni? Puni and I actually graduated Kamehameha a long, long time ago, but it's good to see you again. And uh, just a comment is, you, you know, the, and, and this is in light of uh, what Kaleo Patterson is doing out in Kawailoa and now KKB. I mean, I think we're going to have more and more of these because the community groups have really dug in for, you know, 15, 20 plus years. And now is the time to really look at how we can responsibly and meaningfully operationalize these things so that they can be economically self-sustaining as well. Um, you know, they, they've grinded down, you know, as hard as they can. And now, you know, hopefully the board can, can do its part in, in reaching out and trying to expedite or if not, you know, support how these groups can um, have long-term sustainability. I'm not sure about a perpetual lease, Miss Sark, but uh, good try. But but yeah, uh, but you know you know things like that. You know if the, if you know, member you and brought up previously that there are conditions within our lease that that might prohibit some of these actions actions that I'm talking about. So maybe staff, we can take a look at what are those things, and and for groups like that, how can we be a little bit more malleable so that we can help these community groups. Thank you, um, Mr. Char and then Ms. Barnes. I just wanted to um, add that I did visit the site and Kanoa took me on a tour. So I walked the ground and have the feeling of many of those who have testified and I very much support uh, this application and, and at, at the appropriate time would like to move approval of the board uh, by the board for the staff's recommendation. Thank you very much. Ms. Barnes? I would agree and I don't wanna hold up that motion. Um, just I think to put a finer point on KEV's uh, good point as we're seeing these kinds of applications. And I think we've been fortunate today to get to hear a lot of really wonderful community work. Um, could the staff come back with a set of recommendations at some point 
about how we can be supportive of these, whether it's, you know, um, these kinds of initiatives going forward. And, and again, just to thank um, everybody who's been doing this work in the community all for being here today, really appreciate you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Ewan. Yeah, just to, uh, and I, I amazed at the great work being done there. I'm personally not familiar with it, but uh, I've heard so many good things today. It's It's been a feel good agenda, but I also wanted to make a, comment about the, the previous application. And it's important that we support community efforts and community building like the present application to help help it so that young people don't get to the point that they need an intervention like we have in the at the level that you have in in the Office of Youth Services application. It's you know, we we got to support these efforts at a earlier, you know, at an earlier upstream stage, and that's not the only benefit of supporting programs like like what we have here in uh, Kalihi Valley. But it's we have to keep that in mind. Thank you. Anything else? Okay, uh, Mr. Char, do I hear uh, a motion to approve? Uh, yes, I do. I move to approve. Thank you. I can. Alrighty. Any further discussion? If not, all in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? That passes unanimously. Okay, folks. Uh, thank you so much. Carry on with all your thank great you work. So much. Really thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. All. Okay, board members, let's take a short break till 1015 and then we'll move on to the J items.
Yes. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. From Habilitat. No, I don't. He's probably asking for a donation. I'm not interested in taking the call. Okay.
Okay, I think we're back from break. Okay, just waiting for member char here. Okay, we're moving on to the J items, J1, uh, position of voting in ocean and rec recreation. Morning, Chair Case, board members, Ed Underwood, administrator with the Division of Boating in Ocean Recreation. Uh, item J1, we're asking approval of the issuance of a direct lease in the Manelli Small Boat Harbor to Coon Brothers, Inc. Um, this is for part of the loading dock that was recently built, as well as submerged lands. I note to the board that this has probably been 10 years in the making. We're finally at the last steps. Um, we've, we spelled it out in the board submittal. Um, and I'd like to just, the main points that we've both agreed on, and, and I believe both sides have negotiated in good faith, is that the term of the lease will be set at 35 years from the commencement date. Uh, the annual base rent will start at $45,000. There'll be annual rent step ups of 15% at the end of the 10th, 20th and 30th years of the lease. Uh, we eliminated the percentage rent because the company already pays us percentage rent as part of their commercial operations. Um, we've agreed on the uh, preferential non-exclusive use of the premises and above after that the standard terms and conditions of a lease and I'm here to answer any questions you may have and our deputy AG that's worked on this with us uh, Colin Lau is here as well. Okay, first, uh, uh, board members, any questions of staff? Mr. Char. I, you're on mute. Sorry, you're on mute. Yeah. Is there another lease that is attendant adjacent to the this one in, in, in um, the agenda today? And originally, my understanding was that the other lease and this lease would be of the same duration. Um, if this lease is now 35 years and the other lease is shorter than that, then is there a disconnect? Yes, they also have a lease for the pavilion property. Um, and at the time when we first came to the board in 2013, that lease was going to expire. I believe it was, it only had like 15 years left on the lease. And they were concerned that that wasn't enough time if we made them concurrent. However, subsequent to that meeting, the board did authorize the extension of that pavilion lease um, because they were doing improvements to the property. Um, the uh, um, Coon Brothers Inc., Jim, Mr. Coons is here as well. He has the whole history too. Um, they would have, prefer, we had asked for the le two leases to run concurrently. They, they requested the 35 year lease. Um, there's only a, it's about a difference of, I think six years, the pavilion lease will expire. And then they have about six or seven years on this lease. We felt that, um, we could live with them having the 35 year lease for the, for the loading dock and all. No, I guess I'm 
I'm wondering from a functional standpoint, is the pavilion lease uh, necessary and an adjunct of the lease today? And then what happens because of the disconnect later on? They'll still be on this lease here, but then the pavilion lease will have expired. So is there a, a disconnect? You know, initially the, the, the idea was to make them coterminous term-wise. Correct. So what would happen is um, the pavilion lease would expire at that, at, you know, earlier. Um, at that time, they would have to negotiate um, either rebid the lease for that, um, but they're not, they don't really necessarily need to go hand in hand. The lease we're talking about today allows them to moor their vessels along the loading dock during op business operation. So even if they didn't have the pavilion lease, let's say they lost it, they could still operate the same way with their vessels, even if they didn't have the pavilion lease in okay. the future. Thank you. Any other questions at this point? I, I have a question. Uh, can you, so you said uh, you're, not, you're not going with percentage rent, which I, I gather would be a normal thing on your lease at, at some rate, um, because they're already paying percentage rent on, on their commercial operation. Are, is that on the boating, license, uh, boating permit that they're paying percentage rent? Yes, it's part of the commercial use permit that we issue for their operations. So aren't, aren't we talking about two things though here? I mean, th this, is a basic, this is a land disposition and it's, it's part of normal rent. And the other is a, is a boating permit and that's part of normal boating permit. I mean, I, I could see maybe a modified amount. I mean, it, it would be percentage rent somehow allocable to just the fact that this is a, a small footprint, but if it's normally, there's some formula in there um, wouldn't you do that as part of a, a normal land disposition? Um, we do have agreements where it includes percentage rent and some are just on fixed rent. And during this term in this negotiation, we felt that since they're already paying the percentage rent um, that we're getting it on the one side, there's really no, it, it would be almost like double dipping, I guess you would say. Well, double dipping if it were the same amount, but I mean, if, if, right. I guess if, you know, in some cases you do pay percentage rent on the, the land disposition and some you don't, you, you can exercise your own judgment here and the board can too. Um, but I, I just, I just want to make that distinction because whatever formula percentage rent on a land disposition is a, is a separate topic from percentage rent on boating operations, commercial boating operations. You, you yes. want to make sure it wasn't like double, triple count, you know, counting, but they are different uh, types of payments. One is a, basically a license fee and the other is, a, is rent on, on submerged land. <laughs> Okay, we can hold that for later. Yeah, I understand. Any, sure. any other questions, comments? All right, why don't we go ahead and hear from the uh, applicant, Mr. Kuhn, senior. Yeah, Aloha, Chair Case, uh, members of the Board of Land and Natural Resources. Uh, my name is Jim Kuhn. I'm the president of Kuhn Brothers Inc., which is our family business, and speaking in strong support of item J1. Um, I, uh, I'm asking that the board approve this 35 year lease because it's vital for the long term survival of our family business. And I do want to thank uh, Chair Case and uh, Mr. Underwood, Mr. Lau, and the Dobor staff for working with us all this time to come to this point. And um, I, I just uh, humbly ask the board that uh, as we enter our 
In July, we will enter our 50th year in serving the Lanai community. And now that the third generation is at the helm, uh, this will, this 35 year lease will uh, help provide really necessary uh, security and stability for our company and our employees. So I just humbly ask that you would, uh, that, that you would approve this lease. Thank you very much. I'm Mr. Denver Kuhn. Yes, uh, good morning, Chair, members of the board. Um, I'd stand on my, my written testimony, but just also want to thank uh, Ed and, and Mr. Lau for working with us over, over all these years. Great, thank you. All right, Lemana Demate. Thank you, Chair, local Chair, and members of the board. Um, um, we stand on our written testimony to the board. The testimony basically just wanted to bring out um, a part that is not normally Chair part. Case, um, I'm just having a hard time hearing Leymana and I want to make oh. sure I can hear her. Yeah, Leymana, can you? Okay, hold on. Is this better? Yes. Okay. I just wanted to add um, one thing that is not normally known about the Coon Brothers. Jim has said that they've been working there with the community for over 50 years. I wanted to point out that one half of the Poon brothers are Native Hawaiians. And so they have been working with the generational families of Lanai all these years and are a strong part of the community itself. So, um, I will stand by for any questions. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Okay, board members, that's all the testimony that we have. Um, questions, Mr. Yuen. I have a question for staff. Could you flesh out what preferential non-exclusive use means? And, and I think, so we don't have any big misunderstandings in the future. Yes, that, that was one of the hardest things we had to figure out. Um, so preferential non-exclusive means that during normal business hours, um, they have the ability to utilize the loading dock um, exceeding the 30 minute time frame. So what they'll do is they'll, they bring their cats in, they'll bring a cat in or two, they'll moor it to the loading dock at the end of the loading dock, and they may wrap the second cat to it, depending on how, you know, how busy they are, what they're running. And then, um, after that, then they can leave, then they leave for the day and then the dock is completely open to anybody else who would like to use it. So during business operations, they basically have preferential use of the dock. So another operator, say out of Manele, could load and doesn't pay anything except the, you know, their 2% commercial, say as a commercial operator. They can that is them. correct. And, and they would be subject to the um, 30 minute time limit for the use of the dock. Okay. And the purpose of the submerged lands lease is when they, when they moor the second catamaran, when they wrap, wrap them together, that's the lease of the submerged land. So they're using that portion of submerged lands while they're there. Okay. All right. That's fine. Member Canto. Chair Case, my question is for Leimana. I missed the first part of her testimony. Is she in support of this item? Absolutely. Thank you. Oh, landlord. Yes, we are in strong support of this. Thank you, Leimana. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, any other questions, board members? Ms. Barnes. Um, just a, a climate related question um, with the future projections of sea level rise, are there any implications for this project that staff has identified? The, I believe that was taken into account. This project, the new ferry pier was built using federal FTA money as well as state funds. Um, so the, the elevation of the pier, I believe they did address that. And then we'll have to see in the future what really transpires and they can adjust from there. And do you know um, 
what um, the level of sea level rise projection is that they use in, in that analysis? Um, no, I do not, but we could, I could ask our engineers for that information and provide it to you. Okay, yeah, I'd be interested just for future okay. reference. Sure. I just wanted to follow up on the earlier question that I had. So basically all they're getting is for, is the right to use the pier when they show up, the preferential right to use the pier when they show up. And in other Correct. respects, they are not getting anything greater than other potential Harbor users. No, the only, the only other thing they may be getting is during periods of inclement weather, they could leave the boat, you know, business may be over, but they can't move it. But we would accommodate other vessels as well. So that's not really mm -hmm. special treatment in that regards. They, otherwise they, they don't actually, do they, they don't have a mooring in Manelli. Well, slip 24 is immediately adjacent to the loading dock. So they do have a slip. And that was another one of the things we discussed. We didn't include slip 24 into the lease because that is part of the harbor inventory. And in the event something may happen in the future and they lose that slip, it would go to the next person on the wait list. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Anything else? Right, hearing none, is there a motion to approve J1 as submitted by member Canto? Is there a second? Yeah, second. All right, uh, all in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. <laughs> thank you. All right, thank you all for- Thank all you. Work. <laughs> uh, thank you, Colin, for, uh, you know, extra, du extra duty on this, a lot to work out, and I'm, I'm glad we're there. Thank you, Chair. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Board Chair. OK, J2. OK, J2, we are asking to issue an RP, a revocable permit, uh, to Kanoa Inc. DBA body glove for the Kailua Kona Pier. We had a previous tenant in the, in the it's, a, it's a small ticket booth area. Um, due to the downturn in the economy, they gave up the space. So these folks are interested in it and would like to go on an RP. And we, we are fine with it. Okay. Uh, board members, there's no public testimony on this. Do you have any questions? Yeah, just a quick question. This was a little controversial one time. There were two people that wanted it. There were two organizations that wanted it. Do we have any other expression of interest in this? That, that is correct. And no, we only had the one at the moment that was interested. And who was it that was competing with Horizon at that time? I'm trying to remember. I think it was a, more of a visitor outreach oriented group, but did not offer the, as much money to the state. Yes, I believe that was Destination Kona Coast. Richard, do you remember? It's um, I, I wasn't here at that time. <laughs> okay. They were the ones that put up the tent and had the uh, played the ukuleles when the um, cruise ship tenders would arrive. Mm -hmm. And so they, yes, the, the previous bidder bid pretty high on that site. Mm. Um, and um, so, and with that downturn in the economy and the cruise ship stopped, stopped running, then they kind of went out of business. Uh, what was Horizon giving us? I believe uh, it was 3,000 a month. Was that? That's, yes. That's correct. Okay. So 30, 36,000 a year. This is half. Yeah. So, I, you know, if this, I don't know if Destination Kona is active anymore as an organization. How long has this been vacant? It's been vacant since two, uh, 2020, uh, the middle of 2020. Okay, I think if anybody else was really interested, they would have had time to, you know, noticed <laughs> perhaps. Yeah. Okay, I, so I don't have any problem. Okay. okay, anything else, board members? Uh, hearing none, uh, is there a motion to approve J2 as submitted? Oh, I'll make that motion. Thank you. Is there a second? second. All right, all in favor, say aye. 
Aye. Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, that passes unanimously. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Have a great weekend. You guys have an early day. Huh? I know. I'm not used to this. <laughs> what are we going to do here? All right. We have one more agenda item, board members. Um, and so we will bring everybody else in for K K1. Okay, just, I think we're all connected. Michael Kane, are you ready? Are you there? I can't hear you or see you. Uh, good morning, sorry, I was closing out YouTube and finding the right window. Right, thank you. Um, good morning, chair and board members. Um, Michael Kane, Office of Conservation and Coastal Lands for item K1. Um, this is the first time I've said good morning and got not good evening, so this is a pleasant surprise. Um, item K1 uh, involves unauthorized construction of a road in the conservation district. And um, Darlene, if I can share screen briefly. Yes, you may. All right. Share screen, thank you. Um, so, uh, so many buttons, my apologies. All right, so the area we're looking at um, is in the Lanikai community on, um, you know, on the um, end of the residential area in the conservation residential border. Uh, these houses right here, are not in conservation. Uh, this area here uh, is- uh, in... Michael, yes. I, I, my AG is reminding me that since this is a violation, I should remind ah. the applicant uh, uh, here that um, if you want to request a contested case hearing, you can do it now before we make a decision or afterwards. If you want to do it, you have to do it by the end of this meeting and you have to follow it up in writing within 10 days. Otherwise we're, we're going ahead, so. Okay, thank you for that. All right, you're okay continuing, is that right? Okay, thank you. So um, again, these houses are residential. Uh, the area where my cursor is, is in the limited subzone of the conservation district. Um, the subject violation involves a road that runs from the end of the uh, Po'opo'o place and along the conservation district um, by the residences. The road is on, pay, oh, that's page 37. I'm gonna share a few shots of the road and then I'll stop screen sharing. This is page 29 of your hard document. Um, a road or driveway, um, it's, we, it's a driveway. Um, so these are photos of the driveway running through the conservation district. Um, I hope that wasn't too fast for people. Um, and this is the subject of the violation that we are bringing to the board this morning. Um, We do have a history with the, um, with the landowner here. In 2012, uh, the landowner wrote to us asking about the permitting requirements for the driveway. Uh, we responded that this was an identified land use that they could apply for. It would require a conservation district use permit approved by the Board of Land and Natural Resources and an environmental assessment. In 2016, an application was submitted, but without a draft environmental assessment. We did not accept the application and reminded 
the applicant that an environmental assessment was needed. In 2020, an application was submitted without an environmental assessment. Again, we returned it and reminded the applicant that an environmental assessment would be needed. In August 2021, we learned that the driveway had been constructed. So our, our take that this is a clear violation of conservation district rules and that the landowner was aware of what the permitting requirements were. Um, I do want to note that we have reviewed comments that we received from the community and the um, landowner's neighbors. The comments all seem perfectly reasonable and we would recommend that those be included in any draft environmental assessment with an application. Um, in terms of a resolution, um, the penalty schedule that has been approved by this board states that failure to secure a board permit is a major violation that would involve 10 to $15,000 plus administrative costs. Um, our staff's recommendation is on page six of your submittal. The recommendation is a $15,000 fine plus $2,000 in administration costs, administrative costs to be paid within 90 days and that the landowner submit an application and draft EA within 180 days. So we are not commenting on whether it's a nice driveway or not. We're saying you needed a permit. You knew that you should have gotten a permit. Pay your fines and we will consider a permit and then present it to the board for approval. Thank you. And um, sorry, our staff, Trevor Fitzpatrick is also on the call. Should you have any questions for either of us? Okay, thanks. Before we hear from the um, uh, uh, talk to the owner, um, board members, do you have questions of staff? I have a question. Is, is this road paved or not? I can't quite tell uh, from the photos. It, it appears to be graded and layered with gravel. Um, Okay, because I was looking at um... uh, it, yes, it is partially paved. There is some cement there. Okay. All right, no questions. We'll come back to back to board members. All right. Um, let's see. Let's go ahead and hear from the um, landowner or or the landowner's representatives. Don King, uh, Peter Young. Yes, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, hi, thank you, aloha, Chair Case and board. Um, thank you so much for the time to hear this case. I really regret, regret that I'm coming before you uh, with a, a violation. Um, thank you, Michael, for your thorough report and really sorry for the amount of time you guys have had to put into this. Uh, most of all, I'm sorry for the long delay in me getting an application into you. Um, uh, by the way, my name is Don King. I've been living here at 320 Po'o Po'o Place for about 20 years with my wife and children. Uh, I first moved to Lanikai in 1975, <clears throat> and before that, I lived on the other side of Kaiva Ridge uh, behind us here in Enchanted Lakes. So as a kid, I used to hike around in these hills and I'm very familiar with the whole area and I feel really attached to it. And this is definitely my home and I care deeply about the area. In uh, 2012, my wife and I were able to purchase the conservation land next to our uh, residential land and it, it's a a big piece of land. Um, and the reason we were able to afford it was because of the designation and the inability to build a home on the land uh, reduced the value significantly. Uh, and one of our goals in buying the land was just to uh, have it belong to a community member. In the past, there had been issues with um, 
community being at odds with plans for the land. Uh, but the other goal for us was to get access and a, uh, get a permit for a driveway. So um, as Michael said, we've been talking to them about that and um, uh, starting in 2012, I guess we were meeting with them. Um, our youngest son has autism and uh, my wife and I started a parent support group and also started Hawaii Autism Foundation, which occasionally meets at the house. The support group used to meet at the house. Um, my son, Bo, has caregivers through the Department of Health that come to our home now on a regular basis. And they would have nowhere to park without being able to drive up to the house uh, because there, for a while now, there's been no on-street parking due to construction in Lanikai. But before that, starting in about 2015, there's been no on-street parking during three-day weekend holidays. And that's to mitigate the really bad beach traffic that we've had from time to time. So we're, we're in a little bit of a predicament with a lack of a place to park. And so getting vehicles off the streets been really critical. So uh, in 2015, we took down a two foot high rock wall on our residential property and started driving up the hill. I believe this route was previously graded because it was a pretty even slope and it would make sense when they made these uh, house pads that that would have been the exit point for any of the uh, equipment. Uh, and that was probably in the 40s or 50s, I think they developed this area. Uh, so we started driving up the hill on that route and then I started putting some cement down to prevent erosion. So what you see now is a thin crust of cement in the steepest areas that I put down. So um, it's, it's pretty thin. I think I could remove it with hand tools if necessary. It's not a, a formed cement pour. And so our goal is still to be able to apply for a permit to build a permanent driveway that's properly built with uh, cement. Uh, so when DLNR staff, uh, Trevor came to inspect the property, I was told that what I had done was an alleged violation. I offered to remove the thin layer of concrete but was never given the opportunity to correct any alleged deficiencies. I was told not to do that. and was told and said the matter would come before the board. Since then, I did not do any other work on the conservation land. I regret making a temporary driveway without permits. I feel very bad that it took so long to complete the application and EA. And I put my family in a difficult situation with a lack of parking and then to solve that problem, creating the violation. What I did was wrong. I made a huge mistake in moving forward without permits. I humbly asked to be able to apply for a permit for a driveway. And I also asked that you take into consideration my circumstances and reduce the proposed fine. I also asked that uh, if the deadline to apply becomes a problem, if there's an opportunity to extend the deadline, because it does involve the submission of a, an EA and I wanna make sure that it's all done right this time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Young, did you wanna uh, add anything? No, I'm, I'm just here if there's questions. Okay, uh, there's one more public testimony and then we'll come back to questions. Uh, Mr. James K. Monaco, Sr. Are you there? 
And if so, you are on mute. Hey, Don. I got to run to the store. Okay. okay. Don't use the kitchen. Press star and six to unmute yourself. Yeah. And six. There you go. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Okay, Yay. can you hear me? Yes, okay. we can. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good morning. Uh, James K. Monaco Senior, concerned parent, grandparent, <laughs> great grandparent. You know, I'm, I, I'm, I'm really concerned about this simply because, you know, there are a lot of landowners out there that unfortunately, uh, due to many reasons, and this is probably one of them, haven't been doing what they do due diligence, yeah? And I'm really concerned because a lot of them uh, are blocking off access. Yeah. And I'm not saying the brother here is doing that, but what, what, what he's doing though, he's taking nine years to build him a, a, a driveway. And you know, I, that's a long time. And, and the, my concern is that when you look at this, there are other landowners that have conservation lands. Yeah. And what I'm, I'm I'm worried about is that if he can if he can do this on his conservation land, then what about the other landowners? Yeah, and that's what I'm worried about. And you know, I hate to see the proliferation going on. You know, taking advantage of something that's not shouldn't be taken advantage of, because we don't use we don't take advantage of pub, our public lands. As an example, here in Waimea. You know, our right to the ocean has been taken away because the landowners now own 40 feet frontage to the property. And how does that work? Well, I found out it, it's from the Department of Land and Natural Resources. They gave the, 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 the landowners 40 feet, even if it went into the water. And you know what they're doing now? They went and seen the legislature to uh, acquire electric guns. So they can protect their property. So, you know, that's just to give you an example about what can happen when you do something. Yeah. Now, if this landowner, excuse me, Barabat, but if he can do this on conservation land, imagine what can happen to other conservation lands on all the islands. Yeah. So I think we need to be careful. I'm sorry about his looking predicament, but what is important is our rights and the preservation of all of these lands, because that's why it's conservation. There must be something, maybe there's a hay out there. You know, look at New Valley. Nobody told the, guy, the brother that there was a hay out there, and now they're having a problem. So maybe he should go check his land and see if there's something cultural there. And maybe that might prevent something, uh, you know, uh, things from happening. Anyway, that's my concern, Madam Chair, that if we give one one person the right to utilize conservation land, it will give other landowners that can come to you and give you many excuses why they should have the same thing. And that, I don't think that's fair to us. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, Mr. Monaco, it's, uh, glad to, it's uh, nice to hear from you. Oh, yes, ma'am. Thank you. All righty. Okay, uh, Aloha. Board, Aloha. Board members, um, questions? Yeah, so uh, Mr. King, when you first started the work, you knew you had to file for a permit, but you just didn't do it. So what exactly was going through your mind at the time? Like, you just, I'm just gonna do it, no one's gonna find out or can you elaborate uh, on that? Yes, uh, that's a good question. So um, this is a sore point for me and a feeling of remorse because I have been working on uh, writing this permit um, myself. Initially, I went to some consultants and the cost for them to help me with the permit process was something that I, I could not afford. So I decided to go ahead and do it myself. And then um, I was just really slow. 
with getting it done. And so I was always uh, planning to apply for a permit and I was in the process of working on the application the whole time, anticipating that I would get it done soon. And of course it took many years. So um, I really regret the delay in that. And that was never my intention. Okay, thank you. Other board members? Yeah, I have a question. How close are you to how much work have you done on the environmental assessment? I'm, I'm trying to explore the earlier issue question raised of the reasonableness of 100 and of the time limit. I think it's somebody asked that. Yeah, I, I've done an environmental assessment um, and I submitted that with my application, the, um, the most recent application, it was in 2021. And um, so it, it's a completed environmental assessment, but I think it probably needs some work. Uh, staff, have you reviewed the environmental assessment? Is it going to be, uh, can you tell me if it's going to be bounced or what, or is not at that stage yet? Yeah, board member Ewan, thanks for the question. Trevor Fitzpatrick, staff planner with Office of Conservation and Coastal Lands. Uh, I did review uh, Mr. King's application in EA, draft EA. Um, but of course, once the violation came to our attention, I think we stopped processing it. And I'd be hesitant to speculate on that until we have a resolution to this matter. Um, I think we could um, provide guidance once there is a resolution in, in place regarding his application and draft EA. Uh, again, once the board is sort of decided on a resolution Hmm. Do the rules require, in a situation like this, do the rules require that the violation be brought to the board or does staff have the discretion to accept basic, they, they, they say the landowner is in, a, is in violation and they propose a fine to the landowner and it's paid and then we move on. Is, is, is that an option? Um, hi, Chris. Um, Michael here. Yes. Um, we do have a system for handling minor violations through the um, CMDS system. Yeah. Generally, right. major violations right. do need to come in front of the board. Um, mm. As a side editorial, that mm. has been what one of the delays in processing our numerous unrelated to this shoreline violations, the fact that we do need to bring them to you. So that's context on another issue. But um, th this would require a board decision mm -hmm. of something on this level. Yeah, we might want to look at that. And, you know, I, at this stage, I mean, I'm inclined to trust, you know, you have a violation, you, the staff can figure out a reasonable level of uh, the, the, the landowner admits it's a violation, the staff can figure out a reasonable level. It, it, and maybe we could, I think we probably have to adjust the, the CRVSS rules for this as to what needs to actually uh, come to the board. But I, I think in some of these cases, uh, it would make more sense to handle this without without it having come to the board, especially when the well, violation is basically admitted. And it's, it also makes it easier if there is a set schedule because uh, these things, you know, they should be imposed on the basis of the, the, the wrong that is done rather than so much than on the personal circumstances of, of the individual, I think. Um, so th that's just one comment. The other comment I had is, well, I, I was, you know, I was involved in making the rules in 1994, and you have a certain set of things in mind when you make the rules. What this individual wants to do like, is something that if we were just starting from a fresh slate, I would, uh, the, the driveway, basically, uh, 
there are relatively minor construction that's allowed in conservation through site plan approvals. I tried to see how, and I, th I think probably staff tried to see how it would fit in without requiring a full permit. And I, I don't see it either because the accessory use says it has to be on the same property and it's not as, as the same property as house, which is considered accessory to a house. It could possibly be, you know, you could have a consolidation resubdivision <laughs> and add a small bit of conservation land to the, to the urban land. And then it is on the same property, but that, it, that raises its own issues as well long-term. I, I, you know, I just throw it out there, but uh, we, I, I wish that, you know, and I, as I said, I think staff probably looked for a way that this would not need a full permit when the first thing first came in. And I don't really quite see it either, uh, aside from this thing that I just threw out there of, a, of putting it on the same property. <clears throat> uh, let's see, member council. So my question is regarding the, the draft EA that's currently in hand, um, would that apply to the driveway permit that, uh, that he spoke of a little bit ago? Possibly um, applying for a driveway permit. Yeah, so, so thank you, um, that is correct. So an applicant would submit their application along with the draft EA, and then our office would publish the draft in the environmental notice and allow for public comment. Um, and that's, that's one of the reasons these take about six months to process. Um, the landowner will respond to the comments. We will republish it as a final EA, make a determination on whether to grant a finding of no significant impact. And at the end of that process, um, we would present our recommendations to the board on the permit. Um, and in, in response to board member Yuan's comments, one of the limitations is that this is limited subzone, which is um, has very restricted land uses. Um, and we, we were able to process the, or we are willing to process this under land and resource management as a road that would require a board permit. So um, there would be other cases where we would not have brought this to the board or a permit application to the board. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, who else? Those questions, Ms. Barnes. Can I just clarify with staff? Um, so the, in addition to the fine, the proposal would be that um, the current driveway or road be removed as currently paved or what's the requirement there? Uh, we haven't made a recommendation on that. Uh, we would entertain an after the fact application for this road or driveway. Uh, we would entertain an application that removes it um, and builds a new one, uh, whatever the landowner would apply for. We are not asking for removal of the driveway in this staff report. So then just to clarify, if, if he pays the fine and does not remove the road, but continues to use it, what would happen then? Um, pays the fine, continues to use it and does not apply for an actual permit. Yes. Uh, let's, <laughs> let's hope that doesn't happen. Um, he, he could begin accruing major fines of up to $15,000 a day. Um, and that would also come back from the board. Basically, we would need to serve a new notice of violation um, when the time is up and come back to the board with a new recommendation. I, I would hope we do not go down that road. Uh, thank you for the question. Ms. Canto. Um, so let me ask you, so the landowner is asking for an extension to pay those um, not within 90 days, your recommendation shows. Is it something that we could entertain or? 
I'm, I'm asking. It says item C, um, 2C, shall pay all designated fines, 17,000 within 90 days. It just seems. So um, the, the board is absolutely free to amend the time frame. Um, I would note that recommendation three, delegate authority to the chairperson to effectuate the above recommendations means that the chair would have the authority, should there be issues that we feel are legitimate, we could go to the chair with a request for an extension. So those are the two mechanisms okay. um, to extend the time frame. Okay, thank you. Uh, just a related question on the time frame. So have they, you know, it's the, the, the condition says submit an EA in 180 days. So they have submitted an EA. And if the department rejects the EA, the, the chair would have the authority to say, well, we're gonna give you more time to submit a revised EA, for example. Uh, yes, that is correct. Okay, I'm fine with that. If not, I would want to monkey with the time frames a little bit here because things time passes much more quickly than we think often. Other questions, comments? Char, I guess I'm wondering if exploring the possibility from a procedural standpoint, I'm not sure whether legal counsel might be called in at this point, but whether the action today could be deferred and the submitted EA and conditional use app permit application be processed. Uh, I am sympathetic to citizens getting caught in various governmental difficulties, no parking and things of that nature with the city and, and, and just getting gridlocked with procedure. On the one hand, I don't condone self-help um, in violation of the, the, the procedure and he knew that. But on the other hand, I can I can sympathize with the frustration that he has and is now even looking forward going going through so that um, you know that we would add on another dimension of frustration, bureaucracy uh, and 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 uh, I guess those are my my general thoughts. Wondering if there's any potential of perhaps deferring Michael, you, the you action to today. That, that question of like what I mean, I think uh, Mr. Char is saying, would you bring this as a hold off on this and bring it as a joint, you know, resolve the violation and um, and and act on an after the fact permit? But I, I think your approach is you got to clear the violation first. Um, that is correct. Uh, the current rules do not allow us to process applications while there is a pending violation. So I, I don't know of any precedents where we've made exceptions to that. Well, so me, a board decision would be a resolution on this violation that would allow us to move forward. And, and if I may ask Mr. King, this is an innocent question, not a trick question. Um, just to clarify, right? Um, you are currently using this area to park in, correct? Occasionally, but we mainly use it to access a parking area that's on our residential land. Okay, I, I just, thank you. I, I wanted to clarify that as we have not ordered that Mr. King stopped using this. We've just ordered him to pay fines and get a permit. 
requested that he pay fine and get a permit. I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, just one one comment is uh, Michael correctly stated what the rules are, and this was done in the '90s because there was a lot of public complaint against the BLNR's practice of combining the violation with the permit and that it was too lenient. But on the same token, very often there are completely innocent violations and you don't want to make the person tear out the what they put in when likely had they applied for a permit, you would let them do it. So this is the, the two-step um, process that's required by the the rules uh, to, to clear the violation. My only suggestion, and this would be that we should have a somewhat easier way of resolving the violation um, than necessarily bringing it to the board every time, especially when the uh, violation is essentially being admitted. Okay, other questions, comments? All right, if none, does somebody want to make a motion to approve the staff submittal as submitted? Tommy, you unmute. I make a motion to approve staff submittal as submitted. Thank you. Is there a second, second. there? Second. Second. Okay, further discussion. All right, if not, then all in favor of that motion say aye. 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 Okay, okay. Uh, any opposed? Okay, all right, so we're gonna do a roll call vote. Um, uh, okay, all in favor say aye, and I'm gonna ask, uh, okay. Case votes aye, Yoon. Uh, sorry, Yuen, can you just say aye out loud? Aye, uh, yeah. Aye. <laughs> I, wonder, I wonder if we have, since we do have uh, objections to this, if we want to have a discussion, if it's based on the amount of the fine, I'm, I think we could have a discussion about it. No. My, my negative view is that this looks like a real catch 22. And uh, if they can't, if the staff can't review the the environmental assessment and an application because there's a violation, then my sense would be to reduce the fine to a nominal amount and begin the application process uh, immediately. So that's that's the reason I would vote no. I think under these circumstances, this is not, uh, I, I think the applicant has has come forward. He hasn't hidden anything. It's, it's not, uh, you know, so, you know, I, I'd re, I would go along and vote for this just to get the violation over with, but I would, re, reduce the fine to $1,000. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I go back to what was said by Mr. King that, you know, he, he, he lived on the Kaiba side and then, right, him and his wife had the opportunity to afford the conservation land, uh, the, this additional land because it was in conservation. Whenever you purchase conservation land or anything like that, it's quite a bit of land. I would hope you know what the, the what the rules and regulations are and the, and the do's and don'ts. And, and in fact, he admitted that he did. So the fact that he, you know, the, 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 the conservation zoning enabled somebody to financially uh, afford uh, the, these lands. And then later, you know, when I asked what was going through your minds as well, we couldn't financially afford it. Yeah, it's just, to me, that's, that's uh, you know, I don't want to say disingenuous, but it's schizophrenic, at least in my, my opinion, as far as, you know, what was going through someone's mind. And, the, you know, Mr. Uh, Maluka came on and, you know, he had some other examples that he threw out there. But, you know, I think that the takeaway that I had from him was the precedence that this 
that this can set or has the ability to set. You know, what's the stuff from other owners that have conservation that's like, well, you know, I knew, but you know, things weren't panning out, so I just did it anyway. Right? Sorry. Mm -hmm. So that's yeah, that's I, what I'm I voting agree, for. I agree with what you're saying, uh, and I could not support of uh, like a thousand dollar fine. On the other hand, and and I think we have to have fines that are large enough to be a deterrent. On the other hand, I'm looking at what the individual actually did is put cement over a previously graded area and plant some landscaping. So it's a little different than uh, you know an unauthorized seawall construction, for example. Can I just confirm that? Was it a previously graded driveway? Are you asking me? Or? Yeah. Trevor, uh, I, no, I don't know that it was a previously graded driveway. My guess is that it was part of grading the house pads that were put in here uh, when the subdivision was developed in this part of Lanikai. I'm thinking that is the only way they would have gotten their equipment in and out of these house pads and that um, it was an even slope going up the hill. And so it looked like uh, previously graded, but I don't have any uh, proof of that. Is the, f is the footprint that you did the same as the footprint that was there before? Yeah, it's within, it's within that. And did it have any vegetation growing in it? No. So it was basically a graded route of the same footprint and you paved it or you there. Yeah, there was a short, in and paved it. Yes, there was a short rock wall less than two feet high on our residential property. Part of the route crosses the corner of our residential property. So removing that two foot wall uh, enabled us to cut that corner and uh, made it a... Um... Uh, Mr. King, did you put it, did you have any equipment out there further clearing what was there? No. Did you add any fill? Uh, there, there was some gravel put down, but not in a, um, not in a manner to fill. Um, just before. Yeah, Chris, I mean, you know, gravel, plants, you know, that's, you know, I want to echo what Michael said earlier. This is not whether the road is nice or not. Is it a violation? Yes or no? Oh, oh I agree. It's, a, it's absolutely a violation. I think that the, I would, I would not cut it below 10,000 plus the 2000 administrative costs. But you know, I'm, I'm just tossing that out there. And uh, uh, we can, if anybody, I'm not gonna even, I'm not gonna make, make a motion. If we, we can go ahead and uh, re continue voting on the same motion, we've had this discussion. But if, any, if anybody th feels that we would, uh, you know, cut this to 10,000 plus 2000 for administrative costs, I'd, uh, I'd prefer that myself. Mr. Oi. I think um, the fine is justified because of the fact that he knew what he was doing. He knew that he was in violation. You know, OCCL did um, send him letters that he's in violation. He needs what he needs to get it done. And he didn't do it. And he did it on the side saying, just like he's telling OCCL, we don't need you. We're going to do them on our own and we're going to hide this. So I think the fine is uh, justified. You know, not like this is the first time it happened. You know what I mean? He knew what he was doing. Ms. Kanto, did you want to say anything? Just to comment, I'll be supporting um, Member Char and his reasoning. Um, I just feel that, you know, that the work that was done there, there was prior activity. So, you know, he just... He's not the first one to, to go through, uh, you know, virgin piece of property. He, there was prior activity there. So um, 
I'm going to have to support the member Char's comments. So, yeah, I want. Oh. <clears throat> OK, I'm, so yeah, I would be uh, amenable to increasing the amount from a thousand fine, but uh, not the 17,000. Chris, you're proposing um, 10 plus two. That's right. And I don't, you know, I don't really feel strongly about this. I think that both Tommy and Kaivi have a point about him uh, going ahead and we uh, can't condone that. Uh, I do think that the, the fine should be rel uh, relative to the amount of harm. And uh, in this case, I just don't, I don't see this as a, a really major violation given the lack of change in the topography of the of the property um and, and as, as i said i don't feel that strongly about it but if uh, uh and and i think maybe i've done a procedurally wrong thing by <laughs> uh asking for a discussion in the middle of of a re-vote of something um i but you know uh i i it's, it's up to whatever board members want to do. If we, I think we, uh, if we, uh, we were we were probably. I mean, if we wanted to really be procedural about this, um, we we voted five to two to accept the the seventeen thousand. I could, uh, as a member of the majority, I could ask for a reconsideration, and we could revote it. Uh, we could first see if we want to reconsider it, and then second, we could revote it uh, on a on a different fine amount. I think that's okay. what okay. So let's let's go ahead and do that then. Um, so right now we have a motion to approve the staff submittal as submitted. Uh, let's let's do a roll call vote on that. So all in favor of that, say aye. Aye. All right. All right so let's do roll call. We have uh, Case, Yoon, Barnes. I'm sorry. I'm going to ask you to speak. Uh, uh, Yoon. Aye. Barnes. Aye. Oi. Aye. And case votes aye. So um, uh, who is opposed? Cancel. Okay. No. Uh, Cancel, you vote no. Char? No. You win. Yeah, it, pa it, it passes. Um, right. Uh, yeah, it passes. Okay. Wait, wait, so Chris, are you saying no? <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I, I did not vote. Don't raise your hand and say it passes. She didn't call, uh, call the nose. And I'm voting no. Yeah, it passes. Okay. You know, so we don't we don't have any issue. You know, if I you know I could vote <laughs> I could vote high and ask for a motion to reconsider, but you know it passed. So. Um, All right. So I, I, again, I'm, I'm just gonna... you know I mean we we talked about it and that's great. Uh, I think both right. everybody that voted uh, in favor of the full fine has a valid point, and uh, I I thought we could reduce it a little bit, but you know that's fine. Okay, so I'm just going to remind the uh, Mr. King you can ask for contested case, um, and if you do, you have to do it basically now orally, and then follow it up in writing within ten days. Okay, uh, yeah, I, I don't think I want to contest this. Okay, thank, thank you. you. All right, thank you all for that. Uh, always a hard thing to end a meeting on, but, uh, but it is 1125. So that should, um, considering some of our last meetings, uh, make everybody happy. And um, I hope you all have a, a very good weekend and uh, thank you all for your work. That Hello, brings everyone. this meeting to a close. Uh -huh. Thank you, board members. Thank you. Thank you, Chair